Right. <clears throat> Can you hear me, Elizabeth? Or anybody else that's out there? Absolutely, a beautiful gray day. It's actually a little soggy, but it's all right. And I guess we'll start. So this is Brian Matra at Taylorstown Pottery. And um, today I thought uh, we would take a little time to look at uh, loading the kiln. Um, so um, many of you probably have uh, done or, or watched uh, Potter's Throwing Pots. Um, I have a wood kiln, and uh, so I'm gonna take you first into the show shed here. Um, and right now it's a little disheveled because there's no show going on, um, but you can see some of my wares all lined up, a few things kind of here and there and then also sort of piled up as I have been doing some shows around and then I'm waiting I was hoping to be waiting for uh, the way uh, Duke in the background um, but we will go over and uh, so here is my kiln I've got a two chambered Naboragama style kiln the second chamber, which is empty right now, is the salt chamber. And typically this weekend I would be glazing and then probably next weekend I would be loading. Um, but what I did instead was I went ahead and I glazed the pots for the wood chamber and I've mostly loaded it. Um, and I'm gonna talk about thinking about loading and how I load and uh, glazing a pot just so you can kind of see the process. So um, the first thing I'll do is I'll glaze a pot. So I've got some pots here that I glazed already. Yesterday I glazed this one on the inside, um, but because I tend to glaze raw, which means they have not been fired yet, I've got to wait to glaze the outside of the pot, if I'm going to glaze the outside of the pot. So um, I've put in uh, what's called a Nuka glaze on the inside. My glaze box. I'm going to stir it up a little bit. And this glaze, believe it or not, is a kind of cast, especially when it goes on a lighter clay body. And this one's actually a poor um, once it settles down, I'll just dip it in. And I'll go all the way down to the foot rim. And then pull it out. And I chose this one. You can kind of see the texture that I've put on here. So I'll take a few seconds to let the extra drips drip off. And then Turn it over. Now I don't want to disrupt the glaze, so I'm going to put it onto a table right on the edge like this. And I'll let it set up and dry, um, and you can see the other ones that are here. Um, and in a moment we'll load it into the kiln. So as we go into the kiln, and I'll put you guys on a little stand here so hopefully you can kind of see some things. Um, you'll notice that I've got, I think about 150, 160 pots in there right now. Usually I do a counting as I unload the kiln. Um, but this kind of kiln is a cross drafting kiln. So the flame will actually go up and through the ware and then be pulled back down. And then it will go up and through the second chamber, um, and then ultimately out the chimney. And as I said, I'm a wood fire potter, so 
my wood selection right now is kind of right behind me. I've got about two and a half cords of wood ready to go. It's been split into pretty small pieces. Um, and when I fire, I typically fire between 36 and 42 hours. Um, and so myself and a friend or two will stay and uh, stay up with it, stoking into the kiln for that full time. So um, one of the reasons that people would fire is because the pots get a glaze from the natural process. And so I'll show you a few and give you a sense of what those different things are. Um, so this is a pot that uh, was fired in this kiln and the glaze on the inside, but there was nothing on the outside of this pot. So everything that is happening on the outside, the orange, the blue, the green, the yellow, that's all from the wood ash. And yes, I do, I do burn all of that in one fire. Um, and so as the ash is going through the kiln, it's landing on the pot, what makes a tree stand up is silica, which is the form of glass. And so when it melts, when it gets hot enough, and I go to about 2,380 degrees, um, it melts into this glass that's on the piece. Now, as I said, I've also got a chamber that is a salt chamber. And when you throw salt in, um, it gives it a glass as well by melting the surface. So this is a same kind of pot, a little bit different glaze on the inside, um, but the same clay body, the same kind of effect. And you can, again, see that variation in color from the wood ash, but also that extra sheen from having a little salt added to the kiln. Um, here's another salt fired one. This is a darker body, and this gives you a sense of what's most typically thought of in a salt kiln, this orange peel effect. Um, the glaze in this case is a glaze that I make here with eggshells from my chickens, uh, wood ash from my wood stove, and a couple different ceramic materials. So this one is this Sheladon glaze in the salt chamber. This one is the same glaze, but just in the wood chamber. So you get this toastiness on the darker clay body, um, a little more matte in the glaze, uh, but the same kind of thing. Um, another thing that happens only in a wood fired kiln oftentimes is you get this crystalline growth that's happening on the inside of this pot. So I don't know if you can see that, but it's uh, quite a spectacular little thing to have happen as part of the natural process. So all of the pots you may notice are on little bits of clay, little wads. And that's because everything inside of the kiln gets glazed through the firing. Now I've got a couple different kinds of wads. I've got some that are this kind of white color. And that's one that I've, that's been used traditionally. I've also got some pre-made ones that you can buy from a manufacturer um, that I've noticed I can use over and over again. But most recently, I've been using this darker brown one. Um, and I like the darker brown one because it leaves a different effect on the clay. So this is the bottom of a pot that had used this darker brown a wadding material and you can see it leaves a mark where the pot was sitting up on little pieces. Whereas this one that was fired with the more sort of traditional white, it just leaves no kind of mark and so not as interesting to me. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll wad a piece and maybe we'll even wad the one that we glazed a second ago. So um, you can see that now this piece that we had glazed, it's got this thin powder that's on the surface of the clay. 
And so we're going to clean off the bottom a little bit. There's a little glaze on the bottom. Just cleaning it up with a sponge and water. And then I'm going to add in this wadding material. So I've got to grab a little bit. And I'll make a little coil out of it. And you can see this, this is this dark red uh, fire clay that I'm using. And that's one of the reasons that it makes this, this nice mark. And so, and then I'll make little balls out of it. Um, and then one of the pains about this one is that I have to actually wash my hands fairly frequently. But everybody's doing that these days so now i'm actually going to put a little glue on the bottom of the pot um just so that after i stick the wads on if i decide i want to move them then i don't have to re-stick them on i can just kind of keep going so there's three little dots a nice little triangle is oftentimes a good way to wad a piece because it's kind of naturally leveling so one, two, three. And so I think I'm gonna put this piece right into this space. Um, in a second, we'll look inside the kiln and you'll kind of see that I, as I load it, I think about where the pots are going to encourage the flame to move through the kiln. Um, and so I've got in this shelf, going all the way across, eight of these bottles in there. Um, and then behind it, with a little space, I've got these larger mugs. And in front of it, I've got slightly shorter mugs. Um, and so I'm trying to encourage that flame to go through and touch all of those pots um, as it goes through. And I try to create a certain sort of symmetry from left to right. And then also I'm trying to sort of increase the space as you go up. So as you look into the kiln here... You can see down on the bottom, I've got about two and a half inches, and then I go to four inches, and then I go to six inches, seven inches, nine inches, 14 inches, and then the very top of the kiln, um, I've got about, well, the tallest piece in there is, is about 18 and a half inches tall. Um, so I've got maybe two or three inches above that. Um, and then as I look, inside the kiln um, you can see that I try to create a sort of symmetry in the way that the pots are having some opening space in between so like you can see the handle of the mug behind these pitchers that are in front and so that flame as it comes in it's going to kind of wind around those pots um, almost like they were rocks in a river. So the flame is going through and I'm trying to encourage that flame to go up and to go out because it wants to kind of taper into like a, the point of a candle almost. Um, now, when we fire a kiln, I said earlier that I fire to about 2,380 but it's not really that temperature that I'm going to. What I am doing is I'm actually going to a maturity of material. So in the kiln, there are these uh, cones. And if you look closely, you can see that they're actually numbered. And so those actually tell me how much heat work is going into the kiln. And at the end of the firing, my cone pack will look like this. So the very first red one is this one that's all bubbly. It tells me very early on um, that I can start to change the atmosphere inside the kiln. And then as it goes across, I've got cone number one, number five, number seven. And then on the back side, I've got cone number nine, 10, and 11. And you can see this is, this is where I really like my kiln to be. I like it to be 
9 down, 10 and 11 are both getting soft. There's only about 120 degrees between these three cones. But if I can get to this space and kind of hold it there for an hour or two, it gives some of that really nice kind of coloration and variation that I was um, showing before. So, um, and I've got these cone packs. I've got one here, one up there, and one up at the very top. And then on the back side of the kiln, and maybe we'll walk over there, I also have um, two through little spy holes. So the kiln, the I've got these little spy holes, and so I can peek in while the firing is going on to see what that cone is doing on that side. And there's one up there as well. And let's see if we can get a good shot of a... Can you see a... It might be a little too dark in there. Um, but when it's 2,000 degrees, it's plenty bright. Um, so now that the kiln is basically loaded, start to brick it up. And bricking up is literally just laying bricks in the doorway. Um, and they'll be stacked on the inside. There are hard bricks and on the outside, what we call soft bricks. So the inside, because everything's getting glazed, the hard brick has to be there. The soft brick would actually melt away if it wasn't. Um, and then the soft brick is actually a much more insulating. So it's kind of like, it's almost like a styrofoam on the outside. So I'll move some of my leveling tools out of the way and this mug and we'll start to brick up the door. So I've got alternating lines in my hard and soft bricks. I'm laying them in there. I'm trying to check periodically to make sure I'm pretty good and level. Um, and I'll level it off if it's not. And then once I've got the space over here at the end, because I want this door to be as tight as possible, I'll put in a keying brick. And so I've got two bricks that are cut at an angle like this. And I'll put them in here and I will use them, the wedge shape against each other to really lock those bricks in place. So now they're not going to want to move. They're not going to want to um, to shift during the firing. They'll hopefully be nice and secure. And now because I have done one layer this way, I'm going to go back and be off by a half brick the other direction. So I'll start to grab my door bricks. On the door bricks, I've got some white alumina that's painted on there to help it release. But you can see how toasty this brick looks because it has been fired several different times before. Um, and my next one. And then I'll come back and again, I'll do an alternating brick pattern so that as that flame is going through, it's gonna have to try to sneak out if it's trying to get to the outside. brick that one is not well and I'll just keep on going like that how do I control the temperature so the temperature is controlled in a couple different ways um, one is the stoking. So as I'm throwing wood in, then 
I can either go faster or slower. Um, but what really builds the heat initially is once I get a good fire inside of my firebox, um, it's got a bed of ash and coal. And so it's kind of like, you know, in a, in a charcoal. But here you have this flame that you have been feeding for at the point that we start really getting hot. It's been going for at least 24 hours. Um, and the flame and the heat has been going through. And then the second part is that the walls of the kiln, the shelves of the kiln, everything is starting to heat up as well. And eventually the pots and the pots will start glowing and they start radiating the heat. And so that by constantly feeding it, feeding it a little bit faster, and then also controlling how much air goes into the kiln, um, you can start to control the temperature inside the kiln. And that's why those, those pyrometric cones really help out because I can, as they're spaced out and numbered, I can peek in and if I start to have like a difference between this cone pack and this cone pack, or the ones from this side to that side, I can start to adjust the way that I'm putting in wood, the way that I'm letting in air, because you think about like any kind of engine, basically, you know, you've got a mix of fuel, which in this case is the wood and then oxygen. And so I am letting in the right amount of oxygen to get the right amount of combustion and doing it over and over again starts to starts to make sense about what's uh, what's happening inside the kiln. So, um, trying to think, I'm going to wad up a few more pieces because I've got a couple little spots. I got this one. So here's a little lidded jar. Um, no glaze on the outside of this one, and I'll leave this one raw. This one's actually porcelain, um, and it's got a stoneware lid with a little bit of glaze, but it does have glaze on the inside. Um, I'm going to put the wadding on the bottom of this one, like I did the other one. Um, but I'm actually going to put it sort of inside the foot. And so I'm going to do it up a little bit higher. So it kind of sits up. Like a little tripod. And then on the lid part, because again, even though I cleaned out the galley where this lid goes, if this thing got wood fired and it's the wood ashes going through there, it would melt the two pieces together. So I see Franklin Park is asking about buying my pots. I'm um, on two tours every year and then I go to a couple different fairs. I'm, all, I'm on the Western Loud and Otters Studio Tour and the Catoctin Holiday Art Tour. Um, and people can come out here and buy my pots there. Um, I do have an Etsy site, uh, Taylorstown Underline Pottery, um, but it's currently down because I'm trying to sort of revamp it uh, during this sequestration. Um, and then you can always call me or contact me through either my Instagram, my Facebook page, and uh, we can figure out something if there's something in particular that you like or that you've seen. I also have a website, um, but I don't sell through there, only through Etsy and uh, directly here at, at Taylorstown Pottery. Um, so the lid for that piece now, I'm going to use a slightly different wadding material. So this one is a little bit, it doesn't melt quite so much, but it's much finer. Um, and so it's going to be able to sit in that galley in a better way uh, and not potentially send little cruddies down into the inside of the pot. So just lay that in there. One piece. This one also, I don't have to clean my hands up all the time from this one. And I'll 
just lay that piece up on top of there so it kind of sits up and around. You can see on these larger ones in the back, I also have some wads on the lids, um, but there I've done sort of three. So those will, they'll leave a mark on the pots and uh, it's kind of part of the aesthetic in a way. Um, so I think I'm blinking out here a little bit. Um, but are there any other questions that folks have? Any other things that, uh, thanks Elizabeth for putting that on there. And thank you, Franklin Park for, uh, hosting these different meetings with the artist. I hope to see you guys come out, um, when this whole thing is done. It's been a beautiful gray day and uh, I will see you soon.